Hi, welcome. Thanks so much. It's great to see so many faces here today. This is such an important topic, and it's really humbling to see that in our profession that we are giving our our time um, and so so much of um, what we have good to these nonprofits. And so we're thrilled to have you today. If you're advising on a pro bono or billable basis, if you're volunteering, if you're serving on boards, it's just really wonderful to have you here um, as part of that. My name's Alyssa Zenz. I'm pro bono counsel here at Dorsey. Um, I help coordinate our pro bono program. Specifically, I oversee our nonprofit work. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with our speaker, Claire Topp, for the last 17 years of her 25 years of practice. And Claire uh, is in our health group. She's a partner in our health group and our tax-exempt and nonprofit organizations practice group. And she has an amazing resume of work that she does. She works with universities large trade associations, large healthcare systems, um, and has just done some really amazing work in her billable practice. Um, but what makes her a shining star in, in, in my world um, is all the amazing pro bono work she does. She dedicates over 200 hours a year to pro bono work and nonprofit board service work. Uh, her passion area is the work that she does for NPH International, which is Nuestros Pequenos Hermanos, which is a home, little brothers and sisters. Um, they provide homes and education centers uh, for boys and girls in nine different countries, uh, including Haiti and Mexico and Honduras. Claire's traveled to many of the homes and given just an amazing amount of leadership to these homes. Um, I'd like to mention some of the statistics of the, the nonprofit's work uh, because Without leaders, without people on the boards, this work wouldn't happen. And so the, the homes that she helps, they have provided annually, they provide homes for 3,000 children, educations for an additional 2,000 children. They help get medical service, um, over 11,000 physician visits. That's Claire's work. No, not Claire alone. But if she wasn't serving on the board of those organizations, if the boards weren't there, we wouldn't have those organizations. They wouldn't exist, they couldn't thrive, they couldn't serve. And that's the same thing that all of you are doing in your board service, and for that we really thank you. A um, Few more details about Claire. She's a Carleton College graduate, a U of M Law School graduate. She's an adjunct professor at the University of Minnesota um, and does a lot of really cool things. Thanks, Claire. Wow. Thank you. With an introduction like that, um, I do have to just note today, uh, so great attendance here, but what you all don't know is that there are another 200 people on the phone. So for the 208 people that signed up to listen on the webinar, thank you um, for participating as well. There's another 100 and so in this room. Our total was actually 363 people. What I have to tell you is that I did this presentation in 2011, and I'm not kidding, although Lori disagrees with me, I think there were 25 people who showed up. Um, so somehow we went from 25 people to 380 or 63 people, and I think part of that is a reflection of the great work and service that people do who serve on boards and how active people are when they get on those boards. Um, you never want to sit next to me on an airplane because I get on my soapbox about what are you doing for the community. So I'm really thrilled to be able to share some of my odds and ends and sort of best practices that I've developed over the years. Um, I'm, I'm going to, actually, I guess I'm, I'm in charge here. So let me t just overview real quick. I will say I do have 50 slides. I do speak quickly, but I hope clearly. Um, I'm not probably going to get to all 50 slides, but I wanted to give you some takeaways on the best practice side. There's also a handout here, and folks online were able to get it as well, about sort of my top 10, and yes, I love that pun with my last name being top, but the top 10 best practices for serving on a board, many of which we'll, we will talk about here. Um, and I will actually, I, I do encourage you, feel free to share it with people on the boards that you serve. I do a lot of talking to boards and um, about their work and about their roles of directors, and feel free to pass that along as well if you think that would help. I'm gonna give um, some background on the duties of directors very, very quickly. Um, I was trying to think about how do I get you all to stay awake for the hour and pay attention? And I thought, oh, why not talk about your personal exposure when you're serving on a board? Because um, I thought that might get your attention. So um, we'll talk about that and some of the things you can do proactively. Uh, and again, my top 10 best, plus, uh, best practices, although you'll see there's nine because I stole a couple from the back and I moved them up to the front of the presentation. And then I don't think we'll have time for questions, but if we do, we'll take some questions. 
So first off, um, this set of slides actually, this first slide, really puts into context sort of why nonprofits care about this. Now, I've been doing this presentation for since Sarbanes-Oxley, so it's been a, 2002, right? So that's a long time that I've been talking about this stuff. But it's still very relevant. So you all know that back in 2002, publicly traded companies, um, there was legislation to make sure that directors paid attention there. Well, the nonprofit sector said, oh, we better, we better do something for us, because if we don't, Congress will. So to this day, there is no federal legislation like Sarbanes-Oxley that applies to nonprofits, other than Sarbanes-Oxley does apply the document destruction prohibitions and whistleblower protections do. But, but, but instead what's happened is that the nonprofit sector has really grabbed onto those principles that are in Sarbanes-Oxley and having engaged boards and being responsible for um, uh, overseeing the activities of the organization and have, as a best practice, adopted those. There are a number of organizations out there, both Charities Review Council um, and the Better Business Bureau standards, um, and I gave you the, the links to them, but they are really terrific accountability standards. If you serve on boards and you're interested to see what those best practices are, um, I will say, uh, just a little confession, that I actually wrote the Charities Review Council ones with a whole team of other people um, and uh, spent six years on developing those. So a lot of what you'll see in my materials here are reflected there as well. But it's another really good resource for you. So to set the stage, I wanted to first talk about what the director, your duties are as a director. And this shouldn't be a surprise to all the lawyers sitting in the room and on the phone. Um, but uh, the duties you have serving on a nonprofit board are identical to the duties of directors serving on a for-profit board. Um, and first off, before I get to those three fiduciary duties, I wanted to talk about what does it mean to be engaged as a board member? What are your responsibilities? And I will talk in a little bit about the separation of roles, about the difference between the role of being a director and then your interaction with staff and how you keep out of the weeds. Um, I have a slide on that. Um, and usually I'm in a much more interactive setting where I can get people raising their hands and interacting and I sort of ask you to throw out what do you think your responsibilities are on a board of directors. But given the time crunch and the fact that I'm going to have to repeat what everybody says and to catch it for the, uh, the webinar, I'm just going to go through these. Um, and feel free to email me after if I've missed one. But if you think about your role and sort of think in your own heads about what your role is, um, it is first to make sure that the mission is focused and, and uh, clear for the organization and to make sure it's carried out. Um, the Form 990, uh, by the way, I hope you all know what a Form 990 is. I am amazed how many people serve on nonprofit boards of directors and have not a clue what that is. It is the annual tax return that the board you serve on and the organization files with the IRS every year. Um, it's particularly stunning to me how many people, and I'm hoping it's none of you, who don't know what that is because there's a question on the 990 that says, has the board of directors reviewed the 990? Um, it doesn't say, has it approved it, by the way. A lot of people think you have to approve the 990. It's just, have you reviewed it? Um, but still to this day, there are lots of organizations who still check the box, no, no, I haven't showed that to the board. And you as a board member should be making sure that you are reviewing, you don't need to approve, but reviewing that 990. The reason I reference the 990 here is because um, more and more nonprofits are using their 990 as a PR, uh, public relations tool. And there's a lot of great places on the 990, and one of them is the mission statement, where you can tell your story to the public. There's a website called www.guidestar.org, and the 990 for the nonprofit boards you serve on is available to the public. Um, and so anybody can look up a 990. In fact, that's the, f I drive people crazy. I'm on an airplane, I have, I'm, on, I'm, you know, I'm on the internet, and I'm like, oh, you serve on a board, what's its name? And I look up on guidestar.org. Because I, the amount of information you get about a nonprofit from the 990 is really incredible. But just know that that 990 and the statement of your mission is an opportunity for you to shape how the public views you. You also need to develop and participate in a strategic plan. Um, this is super important, of course, because your role as a board member is strategy. It's not execution or implementation, it's strategy. And you really need to have a strategic plan to be able to do that. Now, I ask lots of people, do you have strategic plans? And they're like, yeah, God, I think we did that three or four years ago. I, I always say, well, where is it? And they're like, yeah, I don't know, it's like in a desk drawer someplace. 
the best organizations and boards that I've served on, they actually have at, you know, you go to the board meeting and it's a, maybe a dinner meeting or maybe it's a lunch meeting, they have a strategic plan on the placemat. They literally create a plastic placemat that's got the strategic plan on it. So it's right in front of you. You also, the best thing to do with that is actually to take one or two topics off the strategic plan and make sure your board agenda reflects what's happening. You get updates on how that's happening because your job as a strategy leader on the board is to make sure that the organization is following the strategic plan. Um, I will also just say about mission real quick that another little cute trick that I've seen that I like a lot is, you know, we all know our names, but sometimes we sit down at board meetings and they put a name tag, you know, so that the other board members knows your names. Well, there's always a blank side on the one facing you. So what I love is actually in the boards I serve on, we put the mission statement right on the back side of that name tag so you're looking at it as you're thinking about the work that you're doing as a board member. It's always good to have that in front of you. You need to annually review your work against that strategic plan and I think it's better to do it throughout the year at board meetings as you meet. Um, of course, you have a responsibility for the finances of the organization and that is reviewing the annual budget and major transactions. Oversee management, but not directly manage. I've got a whole slide on that we'll talk about in a little bit. CEOs never like this when I put this one up. Um, but select, evaluate, and remove the CEO. Sometimes they're called executive directors. Um, and actually, there's a whole bunch, there's a whole body of uh, articles and thought about should they be chief executive officers? or should they be executive directors? And you know there are big nonprofits like hospitals which call them CEOs, and then the little tiny kind of community nonprofits tend to call them executive directors, but they're the same thing. Um, you need to act in accordance with your fiduciary duties, which I'll take up in just a moment. Oversee and not rubber stamp board committees. I've got a slide on that later, so I'll come back to that. And then I think this is really important about adding your individual perspective, experience, and judgment. Um, some of you may serve on boards where an outside body, um, a stakeholder, has the right to appoint and remove you. And a lot of people think that means your duty is to that group of folks that elected you, but it's not. It's to the whole. Um, and, but the reason that you're there is because you come from that stakeholders group or that particular perspective. And so it's important for you to bring that forward. And then, of course, this is the big one, because no money, no mission. You have to ensure financial, I was going to say insolvency, ensure financial solvency. And then oversee the governance policies. There's going to be a lot of operational policies that your executive um, team is going to be responsible for. But periodically, there will be governance policies that will come to your board. If you didn't know, there's a question on the 990 that asks about your whistleblower policy, your document retention policy, your conflict of interest policy. And I can't tell you how many organizations I work with that say, yeah, we don't have a whistleblower policy. Yep, no, no document re um, uh, retention policy. Conflict of interest? Um, and so that is, those are red flags. You've got to make sure that you have those. Um, and again, when I'm asked to sort of think about it, serving on a nonprofit board or I'm in, asked to look at one more closely, I always go to the 990, I go to the governance section, which is part six, to see um, what those questions and answers are. But that's your responsibility as a board member is to make sure that you have that. Fiduciary duties. So there's these three. And, for those of you that serve as corporate counsel for for-profits or for nonprofits, they're, it's exactly the same. Duty of care, um, and I've got a couple more slides on this, but you know, generally be informed, actively participate, and be engaged. I'll talk more in a moment. Duty of loyalty, act honestly in good faith. Um, make sure that you deal with conflict of interest. I have a slide on that. We'll take that up in a moment. And the duty, duty of obedience. I always have. I always think about my dog when I hear this one. Um, but it really is this whole idea that, you know, you're supposed to follow the rules of the organization. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I go to a meeting and nobody has the bylaws, not even the secretary. Like nobody has, I'll always say, well, what do your bylaws say? And people are like, what, bylaws? Um, so you want to make sure that, you know, your governing documents are there because you have an obligation to follow the law. Um, I've had clients that are religious institutions that sometimes talk about God as being the higher power and the body of law, and I made the mistake a long time ago of meeting with an evangelical um, priest and walking in, and I had my little blue nonprofit that book, and I said, well, this is my Bible, and then I took that back right away. <laughs> uh, um, but, you know, you do need to know the rules. It is rare where you actually um, are, are sort of accused of not following the law, uh, but every once in a while that does come up. So duty of obedience is probably the easiest because it's probably the one that most people follow. 
Okay, so taking all of that, and now I'm gonna drill down a bit and make you sort of think about when you're serving on the board, what responsibilities and liability do you have? So first is uh, maybe the obvious one, which is that the Attorney General is the one that has the ability to sue you for uh, misbehaving, and what I mean by that is not following those fiduciary duties. Um, it doesn't happen very often, but it does happen from time to time. There's been things in Minneapolis and all over the country, of course, but for this crowd here in the paper over the last couple of years, there's been, you can see, investigations by the Attorney General's office into uh, directors not being aware of what's happening in the organization. Um, so what are some of the proactive things you can do about the duty of care? Meet. You know, I, I, I deal with boards, they meet maybe once a year, maybe twice a year, so, you know, try it three, four times would be good. Um, the committee thing is a really interesting thing because you, there's no way that a board can do all the work of the organization. And by the way, I will say, and we get a whole class, class, I'm thinking about the law school class I'm teaching next week, about, um, about the life cycle of a charity, and you have charities that are less sophisticated and more sophisticated. You have boards that are working boards and boards that are more strategic boards. But the goal always is to keep people at a strategic level. Um, and while you're doing that, you need people to carry out and do the committee work of the organization. That's all great. I think many of you probably do that and should do that because it's gonna make you very effective. The challenge comes is when your committees aren't reporting back on the work. Well, actually, there's, it's both ends. You either have the problem that your board meeting is the committee chair is just repeating what they did all in between the board meetings or you're not having time for strategy because all you're hearing is about what all the committees are doing. That's an inefficient use of your time. The other is the other end, where the boards are off doing their thing and you don't have a clue of what they're doing. So there's a nice balance between the two, and part of that is getting your committee meeting minutes out, done on time, ahead of time, so that board can review that before the board meeting. And by the way, I'm guilty of it too for all the boards I serve on, where I should be reading all the committee minutes, and uh, you know I sort of prioritize the ones I can get to, but really the goal should be that you have read those committee mi minutes, so you have some sense of what sorts of things are going on. We did have a client about 10 years ago um, where, and it was a big, big thing actually, and it was like about $12 billion was involved. Um, and that client had come on the board late um, and they were gonna sell one of their assets, which was a big asset, it was a $12 billion asset. Um, and, uh, and the new board member was told when it came time to vote on it, he was just told by the other board members, you know, um, you're new to the board, it's fine for you just to abstain. And he came to Dorsey to say, what are my rights as a board member? I get I'm sort of late to the game, but we, you know, the investment committee, the finance committee, whatever, the M&A committee, whatever they called it, at the time had made the recommendation on the sale, but they had not done a really good job of socializing it. So that new board members, no less the existing board members, didn't really understand it and they were really being asked to rubber stamp it. And for me, that deal fell through. And from my perspective, it, it, that was a missed opportunity. It didn't have to fall through if the work had been done to build the consensus around the work that the committee was doing. So it is important to get those things out ahead of time. Uh, you do have the ability to rely on information that is presented to you by people who have expertise. But if something doesn't look right, you better raise your hand and ask a question about it. Um, we talk a lot about the importance of making sure that people understand that they have the right, they are supposed to be engaged, they have the obligation to be engaged, and there should be a culture around engagement and around asking the hard questions. Um, so you need to educate your board members about this. I do a lot of board orientation work with boards that um, my colleagues serve on and uh, clients, um, and we do a lot of talking about, you know, what are your, what, what, are, what should you be asking? And yes, there's a balance if you're a new board member and you haven't, um, it, it, you don't want to sort of slow everything down, but you should be doing your work offline to make sure you understand what's going on. And by the way, sometimes if you have a question, you can bet others do too and they just haven't asked. So there is sort of a delicate balance between those. You don't want to be the board member, the new board member, that they can't even get to the next agenda item because you keep asking questions. So there is this balance between the two, but you do have a responsibility to be informed. One of the best ways, by the way, to sort of facilitate this and make sure board members are getting engaged is by doing a standing executive session at the end of the board meeting. Um, put it on your agenda, even if you, don't, you may not use it, so that there's always a place that the directors can use to process how the meeting went if somebody felt like they weren't being engaged, um, if they didn't have a chance to ask the question they wanted, or they have concerns about the executive director or something else, they have a place that they can do that. So that's a really good place to do that. Um, 
I talked about the importance of not rubber stamping committees and making sure you know what's going on. Similarly, with senior management's recommendations, you don't want to redo the work of your committees, you don't want to redo the work of your senior management, but you do have to have a sense of what they're recommending and why. Proactive steps for duty of loyalty. So this, the, what, most of these issues that come up, and by the way, attorney generals love this. This is the place where attorney generals really find the ability to bring claims against board members. Um, and the first thing is, of course, you need a conflict of interest policy. I mentioned the Form 990 asked questions about it. You need to have one. Um, but interestingly, state law almost entirely across the country has only financial conflicts of interest. So you can meet the state law obligations, you can meet even the IRS obligations by just having a, um, a conflict of interest policy that addresses uh, financial conflicts. Well, guess what? You also have fiduciary conflicts because to the extent you're a grant-making organization, you serve on the board of a grant-making organization and they're making a grant to somebody else, you serve on that board too, your vision's going to be clouded in some way. So it's really important to make sure that you address what I call fiduciary conflict of interest as well. It's important that directors who may have a potential conflict, either a fiduciary or a financial one, disclose the conflict and abstain from approving the transaction. Um, this actually, this third one is sort of a controversial one. Um, I think, well actually I think two things. I think number one, if you think you might have a conflict, you should raise your hand. Always err on the side of thinking you have a conflict, you might have a conflict. But number two, get out of the room. Because if you're in the room, you often, and you all know those board members, and in fact maybe some of you are them, and I might be one of them, where you have influence, right? You're sitting in there, you've got an opinion, people know your view on something, and they don't want to speak up because you are acting in a way that maybe they, or, or they're worried you're going to act in a way where you might sit in judgment on them, or it's just uncomfortable. So if you have something to say, say it, and then get out of the room. Um, I say it's important to address conflicts, the appearance of a conflict of interest. I've got a lot of clients who say, well, unless it's an actual conflict of interest, we're still doing the transaction, we're not, and they can still vote, because if it's not actual, they get to still vote. And I'm always like, do you want that to be on the front page of the newspaper? Because that's not what you want. So you do want to have some way of making sure, and I also happen to think that the appearance of a conflict of interest is an indication that something else is going on underneath. Um, and I don't know why it's so important for people to vote when there is an appearance of a conflict of interest, particularly if your vote doesn't matter. Um, the Attorney General's Office, um, both in Minnesota but New York and a number of other states, has suggested that it's really important to document um, that you explored the transaction with unrelated parties. Um, that's not always easy to do. You might have a single source uh, company that has a person who serves on the board and you can't get away from the fact that they're related and that's the only thing that's out there. But the more you can do to sort of investigate alternatives, the better off you are. Um, I like this one. Uh, you gotta complete your conflict of interest form in a timely manner. And when I say I like this one, I literally have served on boards where they close the door and they lock it and they don't let you out until you fill it out. Now, that might be going overboard a little bit, but it is really important to get people to, um, to fill them out. Um, there were some uh, principles that a bunch of nonprofit gurus put together a number of years ago, um, panel on the nonprofit sector, and now by, by now it's probably about 10 years ago, and they suggested that for transparency purposes, nonprofits should post the conflict of interest disclosures on their website. I've never had a client want to do that. I would never recommend that. I think that's asking for a whole host of problems, but you should know that transparency is really important in the eyes of some, um, and it's important to have a transparent, I think at least a transparent process about how you handle those things. Um, the other thing that comes up in conflict of interest policies all the time is um, should it cover staff and at what level? Is it just your CEO and your management team or do you go down a couple levels? And I think the answer to that question really depends on what work that staff person is doing and whether they're in a position to make a decision where the conflict could come into play. So that's number one, conflict of interest, duty of loyalty, and duty of obedience, or, or care rather. Arissa. I, well actually, Tim Goodman and others in my firm could get up here and talk a long time about ERISA. I'm not going to, but I'm going to tell you this. Personal liability. So federal and state laws governing retirement plans, health insurance, other benefits, subject to ERISA. Okay, that I understand. Under ERISA, directors and officers face personal liability with respect to those plans. In fact, we have a client that was just sued for that. Their directors and officers were just sued for that. So it happens. Now, I have to say, I've served on boards for 25 years. I've never had that come up. 
I'm not even sure I know what plans we have. I have no idea that I'm an ERISA fiduciary. It's just, it's something that doesn't come up um, until I started doing this presentation in 2011 and used this slide. I was like, oh, I should ask about that. So it's important to understand what responsibilities you have. Um, and it's also particularly important because sometimes the DNO policies will exclude coverage for it. So what can you do about that other than be informed about it? Well, I learned this from my employee benefit colleagues, that it's possible to structure a benefit plan so the directors are not considered a fiduciary. Of course, I was scratching my head thinking, well, who is the fiduciary then? Um, and it's the employees. You make the employees the fiduciary. Employees don't like that, but the directors do. Um, it's complicated, difficult to do. And one of the challenges with small nonprofits is they don't have sophisticated HR staff, employee benefit staff. So you end up relying on vendors and on the brokers, and they don't know a lot of details about these kinds of things. So um, this is a tough one. I haven't figured out the right balance on this because I'm nervous about the liability, but I also recognize that it, you know that it's a small, maybe a small plan, and maybe the broker is doing just fine, and um, maybe I am a fiduciary, but everything's okay. But just know that you have exposure for that. You can also, and this is probably the better thing to do, is to look at and see whether you can purchase an ERISA rider um, for the DNO policy to cover you. Okay, so this next one is actually my favorite one. And the reason it's my favorite one is because I cannot tell you, and in fact, I wish I could ask each of you individually and personally, and all of you on the phone too, um, I can't tell you how often people did not know this, did not know what you say. So section 4958 of the tax code, so I gotta talk a little tax with you. And by the way, I always say I'm, I'm the absence of tax lawyer, because tax lawyers are too geeky. I say that to the tax lawyers sitting in here. Um, so I'm the absence of tax lawyer. Well, 4958 of the tax code imposes on directors who serve on public charity boards, I'll come back to that in a minute, liability for approving what's known as an excess benefit transaction, which is about paid to disqualified people who are people who are close to the organization. So it's basically CEO, CFO, certain officer positions, and then the, those are the per se people, including directors. But you're personally on the hook for that. So the first thing that should be racing through all of your minds as you're sitting on your, thinking about the board you serve on is, do I serve on a public charity or not? So that's my other little, I've got a bunch of pet peeves. That's my other really big pet peeve which is that um, many people don't have any, I mean, they've served on a board for years, and I'll say, so is it a public charity or a private foundation? And they say, it's a 501c3. I say, yep, I know that. But is it a public charity or a private foundation? So a little bit of uh, black letter law for you for a moment, for those that don't know. 501c3s are uh, presumptively private. Um, foundations. Private foundations have a ton of rules that apply to them, and I do a whole class at the law school on it, and so maybe I'll do another session for the few of you. I imagine most of you don't serve on private foundation boards. But if you do, there's a whole set of rules that apply. Um, it, that's the default. You can be public through one of three mechanisms. You're either public because you serve um, the public, a church, a hospital, a school, um, university research organization, you're doing something that in of itself serves the public, that makes you public. Or you're public because you um, get donations, substantial donations from the public, like a United Way is the example I always use for that. Lots of people giving little bits of contributions, some people giving big ones, but there's enough coming from a broad enough group of folks. You can also be public because you charge for your services, membership fees, dues, museums, those kinds of things. And the last one is called a supporting organization, which is another kind of public charity, which is that you support another entity that's publicly, um, that do, does public work and is itself a public charity. And that would be like a hospital foundation or a university foundation or supporting organizations. Anyway, you should know, I should be able to walk up to you and say, okay, so you serve on a board, great. Are you a 509A1, 2, or 3? And are you a 170B1A1 through 6? I like I, I want so so I'm hoping one of the, your takeaways is that you're curious and you will go back and look at your form 990 which is your tax return and by the way if it says form 990 PF that means guess private foundation but if it says 990 that means it's a public charity so that's your first clue and then go to schedule A and take a look at it cuz schedule A will tell you what kind of public charity are you and why are you and it's important for you to know for a bunch of reasons one of the reasons is, is that you have to sustain public support to keep your public status, and there are obligations to make sure that you are doing that, and hopefully your you know, 990 preparer is on that, but you as a board member should be 
curious about that you should know. And then you should be curious about it and be able to know what your status is and what sets of rules you are about. But I'm, I'm imagining any number of you didn't, don't know what type of organization on the board you serve. And I hope you prove me wrong. One of the things that's interesting about public charities, though, is 4958 of the code. So when you serve on that board or on that comp committee and you approve compensation to the CEO, and you're wrong, it's more, than unreason it's more than reasonable, so it's an unreasonable amount of compensation. You personally are on the hook for a tax equal to 10% of the excess benefit, cap uh, benefit. Okay, so you can take a sigh of relief. It is capped at only $20,000 per transaction. You are jointly and severally liable, so they can come after one of you, and then you can go ask it from the rest of you. Um, and it's on each director. Now, you know, you have to have approved the transaction Knowing that it's an excess benefit transaction, does, that doesn't mean you, you know it's unreasonable. You know that maybe you haven't done your homework about that, you're unsure. So the knowing standard isn't like the intentional standard of a criminal statute. Um, and it's unlikely you have a reasonable cause. Um, so here's the interesting thing about this. I actually talked to one of my colleagues here about one of our joint clients, and I mentioned this, and he goes, well, we'll just tell them that their insurance probably covers this, or they can be indemnified because you can be indemnified, right, for a lot of these things? Well, guess what? You can't be indemnified, and DO&O insurance does not cover it. Okay, so what does that mean, and what do you do about that? Because you are all personally on the hook. And by the way, I'll just give you a little history on this. I've done this for 25 years. This rule came about in 1995. Prior to 1995, I would go to board meetings, and I'd talk about compensation. I'd say, you know, if you approve unreasonable compensation, um, that's, that's private inurement. And they, they, they're like, yeah, okay, so what's the consequence of that? And I say, well, you could lose your tax exempt status. And they're like, yeah, but that's really unlikely. That's like the nuclear bomb. That's not going to happen. I was like, yeah, that, that's true. It's unlikely. And they're like, yeah, I'm sure it'd be just fine. Now you go in and you say, and oh, by the way, you personally are on the hook, and you are the one that's going to have to pay the tax. You can't be indemnified and no DNO insurance. And now all of a sudden, board members perk up. Because, and this was intentional, it was, you know, these intermediate sanctions is what they're called. So, what can you do to protect yourself? And uh, I love the lawyerly phrase, my clients always roll their eyes at me, but you need to establish a rebuttable presumption of reasonableness. So that's a safe harbor, which says that if the compensation is approved by the board or a committee that has responsibility for that, without a conflict of interest. I'm sure this doesn't happen on your boards. I can't tell you how often I deal with organizations where the CEO whose compensation's being approved is sitting at the board meeting where they're approving it. Not okay, you need to get them out of there. By the way, the second thing is you gotta rely on appropriate data, right? This is making you do your homework to ensure that this compensation is reasonable. But guess what, you can't turn to your CEO and say, you know, we've got this board meeting coming up, we gotta approve your compensation. Could you give us some data points? You need to get your own data, um, and you can work with you know, a, a compensation consultants. There's a bunch of them. There's a bunch of places that you can go to get that information so that you have the comparables that you need. A lot of it is an apple-to-apple -apple comparison, making sure that you are measuring yourself up against the right group of folks, um, and you need to do that homework. Um, if you do that homework, and you adequately document that you did this, which means you have to have minutes. And oh, by the way, those minutes are executive session minutes. And oh, by the way, I have a lot of clients that will go into executive session to do this, but they don't keep minutes of executive session. So they don't document it, so it doesn't look good. So you need to make sure that you have your executive session documented. And then guess what? You don't give it to your CEO to keep. You actually have to have a board secretary or some file, or the law firm, we take a lot of these, you know, that sort of kind of moves with the organization so that those records are kept someplace and kept someplace separate. Um, it's called establishing a rebuttable presumption of reasonableness because if you do this, then the burden shifts to the IRS to show it's unreasonable. If you don't, and we had a client that didn't a number of years ago, then the client is having to prove it's presumptively unreasonable and the client's having to prove it's reasonable. Of course, you'd rather it be the IRS's burden than yours. This is not a hard one to follow, but it is one that you have to have a discipline around, and most importantly, you have to know about. And I think many people who serve on nonprofit boards, five, and I should say one other thing. I was talking about 501c3s being broken into public and private. This is a public rule. There's a whole other set of rules similar to this on the private side. And then 501c4 organizations, which some of you might serve on their nonprofit boards, they're also subject to this rule. Trade associations are not. Um, so 
uh, one other little tip, um, and I always kind of laugh when I think about this, but it, this tax applies to the people who are approving the compensation. Do you know how many of my clients say, you know what, we'll have a comp committee, and I don't want to serve on it? So there is a way that you could have a subset of your board be the one to you know, approve that, and you can kind of stay out of the way of it, uh, but you have to have the, pro the process in place. And, I, and I'm not kidding. There are people who will refuse to serve on a comp committee because they don't want to have to have the burden of this and the liability for it. OK. So if you weren't, uh, didn't think that that scared you enough, and that's probably the most common one that people don't know about, um, you are also, um, if you are somebody who's called a responsible person, you are subject to FICA liability for taxes that are unpaid. This actually happened to my father-in-law, who was the treasurer, <coughs> and one of his employees who was responsible for payroll absconded with all the employment payroll taxes, and he had to pay a million dollars to the IRS, even though he knew nothing about it, and that was the point. He knew nothing about it. You have to have some sense of what's going on. Um, I sort of uh, joke a little bit about, you know, what is the thing that you can do as a proactive steps. Well, one is make sure that you're withholding all the payroll obligations. The second is know whether you're considered a responsible party. The third one I would say is never serve as treasurer, but I, I know I can't really say that. Um, so, uh, you know, for those of you that are brave enough to serve as treasurer, make sure those uh, taxes are getting paid. Dual roles. This is sort of a head nod to Ken Jorgensen and people who deal with uh, the ethics rules. Um, but you know, you all, uh, many, I guess many of you, some of you on the phone are our clients, but many of you on the phone and in the room are Dorsey lawyers. Um, and as a lawyer, uh, whether you're working for Dorsey or somebody else for that matter, you know, you might actually, and this happens all the time with little nonprofits, we, you know, they, <laughs> they're trying to think who to put on their board. We need a lawyer. Why? So we can get free legal advice. So you're going to often be put in the position on the board where you get asked questions. I'm asked questions all the time. And we all like to think we know the answers. Um, but actually, under the Minnesota Rules of Professional Conduct, and it's probably true in other jurisdictions as well, well, of course, I'm sure it's true in other jurisdictions as well, you have to provide competent representation, which means that if I'm serving at a board meeting and I'm asked about ERISA, I'm going to say, E-R-I what? So I, that's not me. I'm not going to know about that. Um, and so you can be put in these really tricky situations where board members have limited resources, but they want to be sure that they're getting some advice from the lawyer that's sitting at the table. Um, sometimes you can find yourself in a position where you have a conflict that arises. Um, this actually happens on for-profit boards all the time, and people didn't used to think about it happening on nonprofit boards, but nonprofit boards are big businesses as well, or they can be. Think about a hospital, you know, a $3 billion enterprise. That's a nonprofit board. Um, what if you're sitting there on, as a board, uh, and you're a board member, and you're trying to decide whether to bring a lawsuit or not? And what if Dorsey's your law firm, right? Now, obviously, you shouldn't be picking Dorsey, but what about the decision to pursue a legal remedy, even if you don't know if Dorsey's the one that's going to be used? So you've got to think through really carefully when issues come up, and that might involve your law firm, if that's where you're coming from, um, to make sure that you don't have a conflict of interest. Make sure you know the law, areas of law that you're um, providing advice in. Of course, be careful of conflicts because the firm has its own you know, its own clients as well of, as the board that you're serving on. Um, and you might, uh, depending on how often you're called on to provide advice, decide that you don't want to provide advice. All right, so there are three different ways that you can protect yourself overall from those kinds of things, although they don't always help, like I mentioned in the 4958 um, Rebettable presumption of reasonableness uh, because you can't be indemnified or protected. But FYI, there's a Federal Volunteer Protection Act. There's also state statutes, many states. Um, I think most of the states that of the places where we have offices, which I think is where people are on the phone, um, they have similar statutes to Minnesota, which is that you're not personally liable, um, you know, if you're acting in good faith and those sorts of things, and if you're unpaid. So then that always triggers the question of, well, what does it mean to be unpaid? Um, and unpaid is, you know, you can't reimburse certain reasonable expenses. Sometimes, depending on the law, you can get a stipend. Most of you probably don't serve um, on boards for payment, but there are lots, there are some nonprofit boards that do pay, and you wouldn't have this protection. So the other problem with this is it's not comprehensive. Um, at least at the state level, it doesn't co cover federal claims. It doesn't cover the 4958 liability. It doesn't cover if the AG wants to bring a claim against you. So it's not full coverage, but it does give you some protection, and it's one reason not to be, um, not to be paid, although, again, many of you are not. Um, 
problem, it doesn't help the organization, um, and it doesn't protect you against the lawsuit. You still have to go through it and prove up that you are entitled to um, the liability protection. So what else do people do? People turn to boards for indemnification. Um, and nonprofit corporations, it's a shall statement, are obligated to indemnify. Um, this is the Minnesota test, but it's similar in almost every state. So you gotta act in good faith, no improper benefit, um, and you gotta make sure that you're kind of not acting against the best interests of the organization, or in some cases, you're acting for the best interests of the organization. So there are rights that help you. That doesn't help you for serving on a little tiny nonprofit board, though because they have very little assets. So indemnification is only as deep as the pocket that it sits in. So what else? Insurance. So this is the one that I always uh, get. And by the way, after Enron, most people serving on nonprofit boards, um, at least the sophisticated ones, which I think all of you probably are, ask the question, do you have DNO insurance? Um, it is really important to make sure the organization has insurance. Now, if you're just a grant-making organization, maybe the risk is small. If you're operating a swimming pool in the middle of the summer for kids in a YMCA camp, risk is high, right? So you gotta kind of make the judgment, but it is worth the investment to make sure that you've looked for it. Um, I did learn that some homeowners policies actually will provide some protection for serving on DNO boards. Um, that's, I've been told that, I don't know that for sure, but I, it would be worth checking. Um, and you know, shop around and see, and there are brokers out there that can help you assess that. All right, so with the last uh, 15 minutes or so, I thought I would fly, and I know I'm flying, um, through some of the best practices that I've got. Um, they are all written up in the materials, so you have it. Feel free to share it around. Um, it's not rocket science, it's just sort of been developed over the years and working with um, these accountability organizations to develop best practices. <clears throat> so this one I think is, uh, this might be obvious, um, but I have to tell you, I've served on boards where they're just happy to have someone serve, right? Oh, if I could just find somebody to get on my board, that'd be great. That's not the way you're supposed to do it, right? You're supposed to be very systematic about identifying what the, na the needs of the organization are, what it is that's changing over time. You wanna do an assessment of the skill sets of the people you have on your board. And there are, by the way, a ton of tools out there on the internet, you can just Google around, Dorsey's got some tools too, that kind of help sort of identify, and you can hire consultants who will charge you a lot of money um, to also sort of help you do this. But it is really important to sort of key in to what the skill set is of the organization. And don't just take somebody because they're able to serve. Um, you know, we talked about compensation for board services. You do lose the state, uh, the state uh, Im immunity um, protection, but um, most often organizations that are paying you probably can indemnify you just fine and get DNO insurance. Compensation does have to be fair market value. It has to be reasonable, and they should be getting some um, survey data to be able to support that. Um, most state laws prohibit you from serving as chair, president, and treasurer, so you're supposed to separate treasurer from the leadership role. Uh, no elected member of the board shall serve for more than five years without standing for re-election. People are like, well, wait a minute, I've been on the board 15 years. That's fine, hopefully you got elected three times. Um, so this is not a term limit, but this, well, it's a, it's a single term limit. It's that you can't be on for a long period. Under Minnesota, I think it's actually 10 years, but the best practice under Charities Review Council and others is five. Um, it is important to include independent mem members. You know, don't have a ton of employees on. I think you can have a couple, but then you have to manage that very carefully. Um, and uh, one of the other things that comes up periodically in this is term limits. There's a, and what I mean by that is literally you can only serve for two or three terms. Most of the boards I serve on, you can serve up to three three-year terms or nine years. That's a decade, that's a long time. Um, but some organizations don't wanna do that. I had one that had a term limit, well, no term limit. When we went to put one in, they wanted everyone who had been on there 25 years, I'm not kidding, to be able to continue to serve for another 10. Um, so it just depends on the organization, but it's good to get new blood and sort of figure out what the best circumstances are um, for whether it makes sense for your organization to have term limits or not. It sort of forces the hand to make sure that you are getting a mixed group of folks. It's really important that you define and communicate the respective roles of everybody. So um, I'm really glad that uh, Alyssa mentioned NPH, and it is my, uh, the love of my life, among other things. I guess my husband, too, and my kids. But, um, but I do spend a lot of time with NPH, and um, I go every year to three homes, and actually I'm headed to El Salvador and uh, the Dominican Republic this year. Um, 
And the reason I'm mentioning that is because of the bus. So um, let me, I'll, I'll get to the bottom of the slide and I'll explain the bus in a moment. So we talked about the importance of committees and how they are important to do the work and that it's subject at all times to the direction of the, and control of the board and you gotta clearly define the scope, make sure it's clear what they have approval to actually do a board delegated function, that is to just make a decision versus when, what they're gonna be doing as a recommendation. And oh, by the way, there's some really interesting literature out there about whether we, organizations as a best practice should have executive committees. I think historically there have always been executive committees because executive committees are the way to get the business done. You have a lot of times people who serve on boards who are bringing revenue, they're fundraisers, they, um, they're, they're bringing a name, they're bringing visibility, but they don't really wanna do the board work. Um, and so a lot of that will rest in the hands of the executive committee. But actually, interestingly, um, there's been some data to show, and this won't shock you, that for board members that do want to be engaged, if they're not on the executive committee, they don't feel engaged. Um, so if you're going to have an executive committee, you want to work hard to figure out the right balance of engagement for the rest of your board members. Um, and you want to make sure the rest of the board has a sense of what's happening in those executive committee meetings, which is why you have minutes, which is why you get them out ahead of time so that people have a sense. And certainly there will be updates often at the board meetings of what the executive committee has worked on. Um, it is very important that directors act with one voice. Uh, I'm sure you've all sit, sat in board meetings where there's contentious issues where people fight and that's where that should be happening is in the board meeting. Once that decision is made, even if you're on the losing side, you ought not be standing out in the public and saying, yeah, I didn't agree with that. That's a terrible decision. Um, and you laugh a little, but actually I, I, I see it. It happens. Um, you actually have this thing called the duty of loyalty, which gets in the way. It actually would not per permit that. And oh, by the way, people say, what about my First Amendment rights? And I say, well, you have First Amendment rights, but you should get off the board if you want to exercise those. So, so there is this balance. Now, I do have one client that put together a list of things that all board members had to sign saying that they would affirmatively support, like with rah, rah, sort of, you know, pom-poms, that they love the board decisions. And I'm exaggerating a tad, but it had that feel to it. I don't think that's the right approach. I think the right approach is to say that you won't do anything to undermine a board decision rather than you have to stand up and cheer for it because you do have your opinions. You may disagree. It may be enough to get you off the board. The other question that I'm asked all the time is, well, how often can I bring this up again? Like, I didn't like that decision, but like, could I in the next board meeting say, could we revisit this? No. Um, now, could I six months or a year later or two years later? Maybe, it depends on the circumstances, but you need to kind of be aware of sort of let things settle and let the board act because the decision has been made. Um, often when there's contentious decisions, you will appoint one person who will speak for the board. Often we will do speaking points if it's more than one person, but it is really important that the board collect, coalesce around a decision that the board is making. So now the bus. So I did this presentation to MPH's um, leadership uh, in Chicago uh, about a month or two ago, and they asked me to talk about this tension between, and I've had other clients actually who are sitting here too ask me the same question, this tension between the board's role and staff role. And when does the board get too much in the weeds and drive the CEO and everybody else crazy? And when are they not in the weeds enough? And normally the concern is they're in the weeds too much. So my analogy, the way I think about this, and, and hence the bus, and by the way, this bus looks like this because I was doing it for MPH. If I were doing it for one of our big, you know, Fortune 10 companies, I might have the luxury van, but I had the little tiny, you know, uh, Central American bus that I got the picture of. So here's my analogy. Um, it is the job of the board to figure out the map to figure out where your and your destination, that's your mission, your vision is your destination. There are lots of roads, lots of different ways to get there. You need some check-ins along the way. You might need some speed limits. You might need some guardrails. You might need some yield signs. Um, the, the driver of the bus is your CEO and all of their staff or executive director and all their staff. Um, they get to decide what tires to put on the bus, right? You're not gonna do that, but what you will do is you might tell them how much money they have for the year. So they have some sense of what the resources are. But how to get from point A to point B, unless there's something really strategic in that decision, and there might be, for the most part, that's the decision of the CEO and their staff. Um, the other question I get asked a lot is this question about um, the interaction between the board and people other than the CEO, the staff beneath the CEO, and I'll just articulate what you all know, which is that the, your interaction is with the CEO, that's your decision to hire, fire, and evaluate, 
if you have problems with that, what that CEO is doing with respect to the people who report to that CEO, um, then you better be talking to the CEO. Um, you ought not be a channel for that. Now, you will have whistleblower protection um, and other processes by which you know, people can bring complaints and concerns about the CEO, and those are sort of paths that are clearly delineated. But your interaction should be retained um, and kept at the level of the, the CEO. With one small exception, which is, you remember that rebuttable presumption of reasonableness, uh, 4958 of the code? You all now are going to leave the room saying 4958 of the code. I'll have to remember that. Um, that particular section of the code says that you're also responsible for the amount paid to your CFO, for example. But you wouldn't normally be in the business of choosing what the compensation is for the CFO. That's what your CEO does. But your CEO should be bringing their recommendation, what they want to pay the CFO to you, and you do the valuation work and make sure it's comparable and you've got the comparable data and make sure that you are approving it. And your only ability is to say thumbs up on that or thumbs down on that. You can't say you should pick, give them a different amount because it is the CEO's responsibility to set the compensation of the people who are below. Um, I wanted to, uh, I got, I've been asked a lot of questions about dashboards, and actually I've served on a number of boards that have had them, and I think they're very, very effective. And this is a way to sort of bubble up to the board decisions that are really important um, and, uh, and not kind of operational things. Because again, we're trying to keep the boards out of the weeds, but you got to give the board enough information to know what's going on. And boards want to be able to just, because they're busy people, want to be able to quickly look at something. Um, so I actually gave you some links in this, uh, these materials. And I actually just have cut and pasted a couple of them. And you can just, like, you don't have to read what's up here. You can just see the pictures, right? Oh, lots of Reds. I better look there. I better learn more about that. Greens. Well, that's great. I don't have to worry about that at all. You know, and sometimes you'll use oranges and those sorts of things. So there'll be different colors for different things. And by the way, that's a really great exercise to go through and have your governance nominating committee or, some, or maybe your executive committee meet with your CEO to say, so what do you think are the things that are important that we should be keeping our fingers on the pulse of? And have the board say, well, these are the things that we want to know more about because we think they're indicators of problems, potentially, or maybe they're successes. Um, so there are a number of different ways that you can do that. Um, so you want to make sure you have these internal controls that have you uh, be able to oversee what's happening with um, staff. Um, part of that, and again, I wish I could have hands raised, do you know how many times I say, how many of you know on the boards you serve what authority limit the CEO has before you have to weigh in and approve something? Like people don't know that answer to that question. It might be $25,000, it might be thirty, dollars it might just be long-term leases. I mean, there's a whole set of rules about things that should be coming to the board's attention. And yes, you're going to rely on the CEO to bring those things forward, but you're also going to have to be responsible for making sure the CEO is doing that. And the starting point for that is knowing what your policy is on that. And so often, many board members don't have any idea of what that policy is. Um, there have been some recommendations that the board should consider requiring that the CEO or CFO um, actually sign and sign off on the 990 versus d d just your preparer. And actually, I think in practice, that's what happens now, so that's not so much of an issue anymore. Um, Self-evaluations. So I, I often say to boards, so do you have self-evaluations? And people go, yeah, all the time. I say, well, what kind of questions do they ask? Meeting time's good. Did you like the food we served? Were the time, you know, whether the location convenient? No, I'm talking about the kind of self-evaluation where you're asking those questions about: Are you getting minute meetings in time? Um, are you uh, being able to ask the hard questions? Do you feel like you're getting the information you need? Are there other metrics that you would like? You know, those kind of substantive questions, and it's really important that you do that on a regular basis um, so that you can effectively do that. Um, I think it's a good idea to do it at least every two years. Uh, there's some organizations that do it annually. There's some that do it three years, um, but you should make sure that it's being done while you're there. So whistleblower policy, I alluded to the fact that the 990 asks you about that, and that actually comes from Sarbanes-Oxley as well. Um, it's really important that you do that in part because I mean, people who work for any organization are motivated to do the right thing, but particularly for nonprofits, and they want to make sure that they're being heard, so you want to have a channel for that. It doesn't have to be a fancy uh, you know, hotline. It can be a suggestion box. Um, I actually have clients who still have people with pencils, and they write small notes, and they put them in suggestion boxes um, so they can be anonymous. 
but it's good to have some sort of a process for making sure concerns are being addressed. Need to have an audit committee. Um, and uh, now, a lot of times people are like, oh, we're tiny. Can we have our finance committee be our audit committee? Yeah, probably. Could you have our executive committee be our finance committee? Yeah. You've got to make sure you have the right group of people that are serving on that. They got to be independents and not the people who are being paid. Um, and you know, you're going to engage the auditor. Um, not all organizations are audited. It depends on how much money you have coming in. Uh, got to make sure you have financial literacy standards. Um, not all nonprofits, little ones in particular, can find some folks who have financial literacy that serve on their board. So they get a volunteer from the community who's willing not to have the time to be on the board, but they're willing to serve on the audit committee. And that's a great way to have a pipeline of people who are coming up toward um, being on the board eventually. Got to make sure you're overseeing the finances and using the funds in a way that's effective. Um, there are a bunch of standards that uh, these review agencies use to make sure that uh, the percent of your money that's going out the door is going out for program instead of expenses. Um, there's what's known as the 70-30 test or the 75-25 test or sometimes the 60-40 test, which is that to use the bigger number, that 75% of your money is going to program and 25% is going to overhead. There's actually a lot of uh, literature, academic literature, about that's not always the best measure because if you don't invest in infrastructure, you're not always going to have the best outcomes. Got to be transparent about your uh, policies um, and about the work that you do. The 990 is available. And by the way, a lot of people don't know this. Nonprofit 501c3s are required to have a copy of their Form 1023 tax exemption application available upon request. Many organizations don't have it. You can get it from the IRS on microfiche, if you can believe that, if you ask for it. But you need to have it um, in your hands. And my last, with my remaining 60 seconds, um, and this is really the obvious one, is you better follow your own policies, procedures, and audit recommendations. The worst is to have policies and procedures that you don't follow. I would much rather you not have them then have them and not follow them. And you certainly can engage people to help you do that. And uh, it's a good idea to monitor um, compliance. I think we have like 60 seconds if somebody has one question. And otherwise, I think Alyssa's, oh yeah, it's green sheet. Um, we will need you to fill that out if you want CLE credit, but we'd also like you to fill it out regardless. Question, yeah. It's not a question, it's just a comment on that owner's policy. It's usually on the umbrella policy. Thank you. I just learned something. Thank you for that. So for those on the phone that couldn't hear, the on the homeowner's policy, it's usually an umbrella policy that has the DNO insurance, and that makes sense. Not your typical homeowners. Got it. Well, thank you for everybody that came. Really appreciate it.